Welcome to the fifth session of the day. On behalf of GLF Colorado, festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer Sanjoy Roy, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library, and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to this session of GLF Colorado 2021 Virtual Festival. Presenting now, Unraveling the Middle East, Ehdaf Suef, Gideon Levi, Raja Shehade, in conversation with Manisha Ganguly. A session on the torrid history and future of the Middle East. Gideon Levy has covered the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip for three decades, harrowing accounts of which he collates in the punishment of Gaza. He joins political commentator and author of Cairo, My City, Our Revolution, Edaf Suef, and lawyer Raja Shehade, founder of Al Haq and author of Where the Line is Drawn, a tale of crossings, friendships, and 50 years of occupation in Israel, Palestine. In conversation today with BBC investigative journalist Manisha Ganguly, prominent voices of the Middle East in conflict discuss the region's trajectory. Ehdaf Suef is the author of the best selling novel, The Map of Love. Her account of the Egyptian Revolution of 2011, Cairo, a city transformed, came out in 2014. She's the founder and chair of the Palestine Festival of Literature, PalFest, and a widely published political and cultural commentator. Gideon Levy is an Israeli journalist and author. Levy writes opinion pieces and a weekly column for the newspaper Haaretz that often focuses on the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Levy has won prizes for his articles on human rights in the Israeli occupied territories he is the author of the, of the Punishment of Gaza. Raja Shehade is the author of several acclaimed books, including the Orwell Prize winning Palestinian Walks, as well as Strangers in the House, Occupation Diaries, Language of War, Language of Peace, A Rift in Time, Travels with My Ottoman, Uncle, and Where the Line is Drawn. His most recent book, Going Home, a walk through 50 years of occupation won the Moore Prize of 2021. Manisha Ganguly is an award-winning investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker, specializing in using open source techniques to expose human rights abuses in conflict, primarily in the Middle East and North Africa. She's the Forbes Under 30 Europe Media Honoree. Her investigations for the BBC have been nominated for and won numerous international awards, including the Amnesty Award, and broadcast to an audience of over 300 million worldwide. Please do follow our social media handles to get notifications on all the upcoming sessions. In these difficult times, we have struggled to bring you GLF Colorado without charging a registration fee. Please do support us as generously as you can to ensure the free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge. You can support us through the Support GLF option button on the right-hand side of your screen. Your support is greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, unraveling the Middle East, Ehdaf Suef, Gideon Levy, and Raja Shehade in conversation with Manisha Gang. Over to you, Manisha. Thank you so much for the introductions, Sharupa. Um, hello and welcome to today's talk. Uh, our session is called Unraveling the Middle East, but since the Middle East is such a massive geographical area, we're going to be focusing on Israel and Palestine, which is the specialism of our brilliant panel who is joining us today. Um, to kick us off, uh, we have Raja talking about Israel coming to terms with its dark past. Over to you, Raja. Thank you very much, Manisha. I think that after 73 years of its, of its establishment, Israel still refuses to come to terms with its dark past to recognize the Nakba and the Palestinian right of return. I maintain that this failure is crucial for the future of the whole region. The country is clearly not making preparations for peace, only for perpetual war. And this affects 
the entire Middle East. In his speech last week to the UN, Naftali, to the UN uh, General Assembly, Naftali Bennett, the Prime Minister of Israel, went back to Golda Meir's position that there are no Palestinians. He did not make a single mention of the P word in his speech, UN speech. It's as though if, if he doesn't mention them, the Palestinians will cease to exist. As though if Israel continues to perpetuate the myth that it is set, it settled in an empty land, the Palestinians will forget their history. This, of course, has not happened over all these decades. It's no way to build peace between, between peace relations between the two people. Peace can only be built on mutual recognition. Neither economic peace nor shrinking the occupation, as Bennett now advocates, would bring results. It will only lead to an inevitable explosion by frustrated Palestinians who have had enough. As a settler colonial state, there is no way Israel can change course as long as it is winning. On this, I'm sure Gideon will have much more to say. Though, this, though Israel appears to be doing well, it is at a, at, a, at a price of becoming an apartheid state and likely to become a pariah state. There has not been, there has not been success in suppressing Palestinian sense of self. At the same time, Israel had plans all along over the West Bank. The present Israeli actions and policies in the West Bank could have been read from past changes in laws governing the occupied Palestinian territories, including land seizures and land use planning that Israel was making from the late 1970s. These fundamental changes got consolidated in the Oslo Accords in 1993-1995, dooming the chances for peace. To me, this reflects on the failure of Palestinian leadership past and present. What is taking place now in the West Bank of extensive settlement building through taking over lands through various spurious legal means was all predictable. I had described it in my 1985 book, Occupier's Law, and Miron Benvenesti had provided an extensive database of the details. Yet none of this was taken into account in the negotiations or preparation for negotiations to avoid it becoming permanent. The Oslo Accord of 1995 ended up consolidating these crucial changes in the law. The PLO seemed not to be fully cognizant of Israel's modus operandi and fell prey to these plans for gradual takeover. The PLO failed to follow the Israeli plans in the occupied Palestinian territories during the long course of the occupation because it thought it would simply revoke all of them when the time comes. So why bother? But this meant that it didn't know how to negotiate them when the moment came at Oslo and after. Thus, the Palestinian Authority was placed in a corner from which it doesn't have a plan to emerge. It continues to proclaim that these actions by Israel are contrary to international law, but this is not enough. International law will not come to our rescue and will not as long as we are powerless. The false hope that we all have time to work things out when the trajectory is towards the precipice. The region can explode into a nuclear war. No deterrence as long as there is unrestricted US support for Israel. The way of Israel is of continuous threat of war. The fear is that it might lead to actual war then catastrophe will strike. There is always the looming fear of another Nakba, which has been in the offing as the ultimate plan for the solution of Palestine. I'm sure my colleagues will have more to say on this. Thank you. Gideon, you've done a significant amount of work on the occupation and you maintain that the, both that the occupation was never meant to be temporary and that the two-state solution is dead. Would you like to comment on uh, Raj's views? Yes, Manisha, thank you very much. I'm extremely happy to be back to the Jaipur Festival. Uh, it was an unforgettable experience to be in Jaipur, and it's always nice to be in one of its uh, branches like tonight. Uh, 
it's also a special, it has also a special meaning for me to speak after Raja, who was one of the first Palestinians I've ever met as an adult, and the first Palestinian that I wrote about his very early book, The Third Way. And here we are together tonight, and I think that Raja will agree with me that very little changed ever since we met the first time, which is really many decades ago. Too little, very little, if at all. And I think we are reaching now a time of truth, a time of putting an end to many masquerades, to really tear upon the faces the masks that are covering us for so many years, the masks that cover the world, Israel, and apparently also Palestine. For the world and for Israel, it was always very convenient to believe that the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza is a temporary phenomena. Just give us a few years, just Israel will find a partner, just there will be a suitable, the suitable conditions and Israel will pull out. Many Israelis, many Europeans, many Americans, Indians and others believed in it. It was very convenient to believe in it. Because if there is a solution and the solution is just somewhere on a shelf, we just have to take it in the proper moment and to go for it. And the solution was a very simple and logical one, the two-state solution. Namely, two peoples are struggling over one piece of land. Let's divide the land and we'll get two sovereign countries, two sovereign states, self-determination determination for the Palestinians, self-determination for the Jewish Israelis. But as time goes on, and we are now celebrating over 50 years of occupation, nobody can buy it anymore. I mean, it's time to call the bluff. And the bluff is and was that the truth is that Israel never had in mind to give up the occupied territories. There was not a single Israeli prime minister who meant seriously to let the Palestinians have an equal state, a viable state, a state like any other state in the world. This, those tricks of the two-state solution of the uh, temporary uh, character of the occupation served the occupation, served to make the occupation as an endless phenomena. Because if it is not temporary, if it is temporary, so Israel can be defined as a democracy. It has some problem, problems in its dark backyard, but it's not part of Israel and it's temporary. So Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel shares values with the West, democracy and freedom of speech and so forth and so forth. But if we came now to this moment of truth in which we realize that this was a masquerade, that the occupation is there to stay, and that's my conclusion, and it is an inevitable conclusion after so many years. Because one thing must be clear, we are far today from putting an end to the occupation than 50 years ago we are going and getting far and far, not closer and closer. So that's the moment to realize that the occupation is part and parcel of Israel, that the occupied territories are part and parcel of Israel. And if so, Israel cannot be defined anymore as a democracy, because there is nothing like this, a democracy for 10 million people and a brutal tyranny for another 5 million people. This doesn't exist. Because if part of the people who are living under Israeli law or Israeli uh, uh, government are not living in democracy, so Israel is not a democracy. You can't be half pregnant, you can't be half democratic. This conclusion should lead the world, at least, if not us Israelis, at least the world, 
It should lead for a wake-up call, namely, dear world, dear friends, you are facing the second apartheid state after South Africa. You are facing an apartheid state and you are hugging this apartheid state. The Israeli apartheid state is still the darling of the United States, of Europe, of India, of many countries. Are you aware that you are hugging and financing and arming an apartheid state? Are you ready to take the same measures that you took against the first apartheid state, which were declared as a head of a success? Because without the interference of the world, the apartheid system in South Africa may, may have continued until this very moment. Are you ready to use the same methods, the same means to put an end? Or you are accepting an apartheid state and you don't care about its nature, you don't care about five million people who don't have a citizenship of any country in the world. Unheard of. Five million people who don't have citizenship, who don't have a state to belong to. You don't have it in the 21st century. You have it here in this part of the world. So to conclude my opening remarks, remarks, I would like just to emphasize one thing. Don't expect the change to come from within Israel. This will not happen. The Israelis will not wake up one shining morning after 53 years of occupation in which they paid a very little price for the occupation and gained a lot. Don't expect them to wake up one morning and say, no, this is not so nice, this is not so kind, let's put an end to it. This will not happen. And the only way to make it happen is to make Israelis pay and be punished for the occupation. And this can only the international community do. And that's really a moment of truth for the international community. Are you in favor of an apartheid state or not? That's the only relevant question which is on the table. Forget about the two-state solution because not only it's dead, it was never born. There is a one state for 53 years now. And the only question is, is it an apartheid state or is it a democracy? Thank you very much. Thank you for those remarks, Gideon. Uh, over to Adaf, you, you talk along similar, similar lines when we discussed, you said that Israel's aim right now is to have maximum land with minimum Palestinians. Would you like to expand on that? Hi, um, yes, well, thank you, Manisha. And uh, let me just say that um, it's always wonderful to be at JLF, although, of course, from one's own uh, one's own home now um and great to be at uh, the uh, the boulder colorado festival and it is such an honor to share a platform with um with Gideon Levy and my very good friend Raja Shahada it's um it's very good although of course one always hopes that soon there will won't be any reason to share this platform. But yes, now obviously I'm in agreement with everything that uh, that has been said. And um, I think uh, moving on from, uh, from what Gideon has said and what Raja has said, yes, it's, um, I think it would be good to look at the resistance that is happening now to start by looking at the resistance because of course, um the, the 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 Israeli bet was as has often been expressed was on people forgetting so one generation would be decimated another generation would be turned into refugees and and then the young people would forget and that hasn't happened and in fact the resistance has broadened and has certainly continued and what we saw recently um uh, sort of a, a few months ago when there was a particular, um, like, uh, I don't know, um, sort of um, climax with uh, attacks on Al-Aqsa and so on. And then the sort of resistance kicked on Sheikh Jarrah, um, 
specifically, and, and, and then Gaza stepped in to sort of provide some cover for, for Sheikh Jarrah. I think that, not I think, I mean, it's clear that it was a new phase in internal Palestinian resistance because um, for the first time in a long time, we saw the coordination, we saw the common language between Palestinians in the occupied cities of the West Bank, Palestinians within the Green Line, within the 48, i.e. in Nazareth and, and, and Haifa and Lud and Umm al fahma and so on, Palestinians in Gaza as well. And then of course the Palestinians also abroad in the diaspora. So suddenly there was this absolutely across the board um, acting out of something that many people knew was the case, which is, this is one people. Uh, so despite Israeli attempts across the decades to fragment this population, uh, there is actually very solidly and very clearly, and it came to the fore in these last few months, the Palestinian people as, as a whole. So I think that it's really important to note this new step and to note also alongside that, that there is now a generation of Palestinians who were brought up to, in, in the um, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist discourse of today. So for a long time, um, one of the strengths of Israel really was that a lot of Jewish people in the West who supported uh, Israel were actually people who belonged in the West, i.e. were American Jews or French Jews or British Jews, and therefore they were part of the culture, they uh, spoke the language, they were familiar with the idiom, they were part of society, and so they were able to, to play a pretty important role in um, you know, in, 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 in gathering support and in advocacy and, uh, and arguing Israel's case. Uh, we are now in a situation where there, there are Palestinians and Arabs who are in that position. In other words, who have grown up in the West or who have been educated in the West and who can speak to the West on its own terms and in its own language. And I think that is that is really important. I think it's it's important to remember that the Palestinian Israeli struggle um, or the, the Israeli war against Palestine was never uh, something that was happening out there and had nothing to do with the rest of the world. It was always firmly embedded in the world so that when it first started when the when Zionism started as a movement at the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century. It could only move forward by drumming up support and drumming up funds from the West. Um, so whether it was the actual uh, cooperation and connivance of the British when they had the mandate over Palestine and actually enabled the Zionists to, to take over, or whether it was the uh, donations that came from people in civil society in America to something like the Jewish National Fund, which was one of the first instruments to take over Palestinian land and an overtly racist instrument, which took over land and prohibited its sale or rental to an Arab. And this Jewish National Fund was, was funded um, by American uh, donors and in fact still continues to operate as a charity in the United States. So basically Israel developed and, and was born and grew in the incubator of Western support. Um, and it has continued to depend on Western support, although now, of course, there have been countries in, in the Arab region, the Emirates, uh, there has been India under uh, Prime Minister Modi that have joined the, uh, the supporters of Israel, um, which is a strange thing at this point, but anyway. Um, and, and so it is, it, is, it is very, I think it's very useful to remember this, not 
so much because of the past, although that matters, but because of its position now. So now, support for Israel is, is um, it's still something, it's still a lifeline. It's still something that Israel cannot survive without, but the, uh, the traffic, the benefits are not one way because Israel now is at the cutting edge of uh, various uh, technological es exports, arms, uh, surveillance, uh, intelligence, um, and so on. So there is, there, is a, there is a back and forth between it and, and the, you know, the powers that support it. And of course, as is always said, it has an edge because it has tested its, its, uh, its weapons and so on on its captive population, the Palestinians. But it's, it's really important um, while we note the spread of support for Palestinians, it's important to note Israel's effect on the world. So its export of surveillance, its export of malign technology, of weaponry, um, its export of notions such as perpetual war, of a, a mindset and an attitude to the world, which is antagonistic, imperial, uh, negative, and what that means for for the world, and I think this is, and 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 you know, I don't know, whatever area you look at now in the sort of global struggle to try to create a new world, Israel will be playing a lead part in holding on to and strengthening the system that is actually destroying the world. So. I think I think that this this is is really important to note that placing. But what gives us heart, of course, is that also support for Palestine for the Palestinian cause is now becoming more and more universal. You have specific things like uh, that are measurable, like BDS, for example, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which is making breakthroughs and and certainly has become a force to be reckoned with but you also actually have a very clear um, um, phenomena like uh, particularly young Jewish Americans for example who have now become very open and very loud and very uh, inventive in expressing their rejection of having, you know, the Israeli crimes sort of, you know, uh, attributed to them or, or done in their name. So you have groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, like Not In Our Name, like, it, you know, you, you can't count them and, and they're excellent. Um, and I think really they're going to be absolutely essential to the, the finding of, um, of a way a way forward. And I think also it's interesting and it's heartening to note that while a long time ago, or even, you know, until let's say maybe 20 years ago, 10 years ago, Israel looked as if it was the, the modern, the progressive, and it was fighting sort of backward Arabs. Whereas now, really, Israel is just repeating repeating the same arguments over and over again. Um, the settlers are, are, are taking a, a more open and a more, um, a more active uh, role in establishing the state of affairs that the state wants. So, so the settlers are moving forward to attack, to, 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 um, to destroy olive groves, to actually burn people's houses, and so on. And of course, the settlers are, you know, they talk the, the language of, of myth, of the, this land was, was ours because it was ours 2,000 years ago, and so on. And, and so that, that aspect of, the, uh, of, of Israel's project is coming, is being foregrounded more and more, plus the old colonial arguments, uh, plus the arguments that people now, just everybody knows that they are a lie. Whereas, on the other hand, of course, the Palestinians are looking 
and being more and more progressive as they join forces with progressive movements like Black Lives Matter, like, uh, you know, making common cause with the indigenous people of America, like uh, there's a very strong feminist strand in the Palestinian, the young Palestinian movement in actually rejecting their leadership because of its failures and, and betrayals and presenting this, uh, you know, this young, uh, militant, hopeful, eloquent, smart uh, face and voice to the world. So I, I think that, that, that there is a, a truer picture, actually, that is emerging now and that you can, you can kind of like count on people knowing. But I think that the battle on the ground, as my friends have said, uh, is becoming more and more fierce. It's becoming more and more a zero sum battle. And I agree that there really is not, is not, is not, is not much time, but there isn't much time for anything. There isn't much time really for, for the world. And Palestine is very, very much at the heart of everything that is happening and the conflicts that are in the world. Thank you so much for that, Adaf. Um, you've all, all three of you have touched on three very critical points. One, that this seems to be a never-ending occupation. Two, that there has been, with Sheikh Jarrah and um, the ongoing violence, there has been a recent escalation of violence that's kind of out of sorts with before. And the third point is that it, as a counterpoint to that violence, there has been a sort of international solidarity and resistance movements that have come up in, uh, in response to that. So th my question is for um, all of you on the panel, uh, where do you see that culminating? We only have, um, unfortunately, 10 more minutes. So I just wanted to understand where you saw this going. If I may start, I would like to, may I start? Yeah, of course. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, uh, commenting on what Gideon has said, uh, the possibility of, of the masquerade, that the occupation is temporary and so on, was made possible while the effective censorship of uh, the voices of Palestinians who are trying to communicate to the world what is happening and how it's happening and, and were censored. Uh, and, and that made it possible to perpetuate the myths, the various myths, of uh, whether of the past or of the present. But this has changed and is changing. And now the media, including some establishment media, is much more open to the Palestinians. And therefore, the possibilities for, um, for bringing forward the, the truth of this situation is, is much more. And, and at the same time, where it's going, I'm afraid it's not going fast enough. I think uh, uh, war is much more likely than, than peace and, and war can be nuclear and that's very dangerous. And, and that should be a message that we should put forward, I think, because it's a very dangerous, critical, inflammatory situation in the Middle East. Gideon, you call yes. this um, uh, never ending occupation, but at the same time, um, as uh, others correctly pointed out, there has been an escalation of violence and international solidarity and responses against that violence. So where do you see that going in terms of the occupation? I'm afraid I'm a, a bit more skeptical than Adav and Raja, and even I would say more pessimistic, namely about the world. The world and the international community, the civil societies, were our last hope. But recently you see two very, very uh, worrying phenomena or developments. First of all, the world is losing interest in this conflict, unfortunately so. The world is preoccupied now with new issues like environment and immigration. The world sees that the Palestinians are helpless, the Israelis are by far too strong, and nothing is changing. To this you have to add another new development, 
And this is the new strategy of Israel, which is extremely successful, mainly in, the, in Europe, but also in the United States. Namely, to label any kind of criticism of Israel as anti-Semitism. This paralyzed Europe. This is paralyzing from time to time, even some voices in the United States. And we must warn the civil societies in, in the world that someone is playing with their freedom of speech. Someone is manipulating them. And this is dramatically uh, damaging the struggle of those circles. And there are obviously many circles, mainly in the civil societies in Europe, in the United States, in the campuses, everywhere, who still fight for freedom to the Palestinians, who still fight for their rights, who are still devoted and courageous but they are being silenced more and more so. And that's really for the international community to ask itself, are we collaborating with this anti-democratic step in which criticizing Israel becomes a criminal behavior? What is it? So on one hand, there is hope from new circles, from new generations, from students, on the other side, we see really that the world is moving toward other challenges. And the Palestinians, as usual, are left alone, bleeding, bleeding alongside of the, of the road. Adolf, would you like to jump in now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, what an image. Uh, yes, I agree, of course, that the, the, the world turn, turns away to look at other issues and other problems, but it can always turn back again. And I think part of our job is to, is to, is to carry on placing Palestine in the consciousness of people who care about climate, who care about the world, who care about other issues, because they are all linked, they're all interrelated, really. Um, I, I'm actually interested, I mean, I, I hear Raja and I hear what he's saying, but I, I, I mean, when Raja, when, may I ask, when you talk about nuclear war, it would be between who and who? Well, I think that the fact that Israel has nuclear fa facility yeah. and Iran might be having a nuclear facility. Right. Uh, any moment they can erupt. I mean, right. Right. That, well, that's it, my fear. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's yeah. a serious fear. That I have. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, I think, I think Israel. Part of what it does all the time is push towards war. Not perhaps it, it does it, but push, push yeah. others, push America mainly towards war, push the Saudis towards war, and and certainly it now has its uh, or has had for a long time its eyes on on Iran and is is pushing for a conflict uh, with Iran and and and. That is that is hugely um, yeah hugely dangerous. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, quite honestly, I really, I mean, <sighs> Palestinians are doing absolutely everything, everything that they can to resist what is happening to them. And every day, if you look. If you actually look at Palestinian news, there isn't a day that passes without somebody being killed. Um, often, more than one person, without funerals, without and without acts of resistance as well. But as as Gideon says, and as Raja has said, this they aren't going to do this on their own. So they are mounting a holding operation and have been mounting a holding operation for a hundred years. And it is heartbreaking because of course it relies on the outside coming in to, to help, to say, okay, this is what needs to happen and it needs to be the international community. So I would just say that we have to carry on, have to carry on working. Uh, the issue of censorship and of Gideon saying um, 
your freedom of speech in the West is being destroyed. I think that is a battle that has been taken up. We see a lot of universities having that fight. The fight is legal, it's in the courts. It's an ongoing battle and the only choice that we have is to continue it. Thank you so much for that, Adaf. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, Gideon, Adaf and Raja, thank you so much for your time and the discussion. It has left us with much food for thought. Thank you, everyone who joined in for the session, for listening, and over to you now, Sharupa. Thank you, Adaf, Gideon, Raja, and Manisha for that insightful deep dive into the conflict ridden situation that is prevalent in the Middle East. Oh, we all pray and hope that there is some help, something that happens that turns it to a positive side. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage all of you to buy the books of our speakers that are available at the Boulder Bookstore. We would like to thank all our official partners and we hope that you all enjoy these conversations and will tune back in for our next session which is the secret keeper of Jaipur, Alka Joshi in conversation with Arsen <coughs> Kashkashian. This will be at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 5 p.m. Central Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, and 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And now we present a reading from the JLF Writer Shorts series by writer Philip A. Ludgendorf on the Epic of Ram. <music> Hello, my name is Philip Lutkendorf. Um, I have been a professor of Hindi and modern Indian studies at the University of Iowa until my retirement several years ago. And for the last 11 years or so, I've been engaged in a very challenging but satisfying work of offering a new English translation of one of the great classics of Indian literature and Hindu devotional literature, the Ram Charit Manas of Tulsidas a retelling of the Ramayana epic in a dialect of Hindi composed in the late 1500s. Uh, this is coming out in a series called the Murti Classical Library of India, and the epic is appearing as under the title The Epic of Ram as a seven volume bilingual translation. So with the original uh, text and the my, my English translation. Uh, five volumes have appeared to date, and uh, volume six is due to come out um, at the end of 2021, and volume seven at the end of 2022. I'm going to read a very short passage from this. This is a scene, a beloved scene from book five, the Sundarakand, uh, in which the monkey Hanuman uh, visits Sita in her place of captivity on the island of Lanka, the heroine, and brings her a message of comfort and love from her husband, Ram. Um, I won't read the whole uh, of the Hindi section. I'll just read a part of it, and then I'll read my English translation of this passage. Um, Ragupati karasande su abha sunu janani dhari dhir Asakahika Barid tapata te la janu barisa. Je hita rehe karata te ipira. Uragaswasa samatri bidha samira. Kahe hu te kachuduka gati hoi. Kahi kaho yehe jana nakoi. I'll go now to the English translation. Hanuman speaks. He says, Now here is the Ragu Lord's message, mother. Compose yourself and listen to it. As he said this, the monkey's voice broke and his eyes filled with tears. Ram says, Separated from you, Sita, all pleasing things have turned against me. Budding tree shoots sear me like embers. Night is an apocalypse, the moon sun hot. 
Massed lotus buds poke me like spears, while rain clouds seem to release boiling oil. Once beneficent things now cause only pain. Cool, fragrant breezes burn like serpent's breath. Speaking of one's sorrow lessens it somewhat, but whom can I tell? No one comprehends it. The secret of our mutual love, dearest, my heart alone knows, and it remains forever with you. Thank you. A festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. and. Um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. sense to me religion and art are the same thing. They're vaguely irrational but they help make sense of things. Someone who lives with no arts and no religion has very little to live on. 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. You have to think of viruses as intelligent machines, as code crackers, and like all living forms they have to adapt to their environment. Imagination is a powerful tool. It doesn't matter which part of the world we are in our situation. Are we behind locked bars? Are we roaming freely, independent thought and process? Our imagination allows us to soar out of any present circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that really is the power of literature and the written word. It allows us to envision a better future. It allows us to consider our past and make sense of the present. Imagination is a tool to be able to free us from the binds and the constrictions that we find ourselves locked into. We can break free, we can soar through the universe, we can rise up into the darkened night like a firefly illuminating the world. This is what JLF Golden Colorado hopes to bring you something to fire your imagination.